Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com and I'm going to get back to doing artist reviews and with their upcoming record, uh, it kind of makes sense, it's in January, the band Pain of Salvation, who's a band I've loved for a number of years, uh, have a new album and I thought I'd go ahead and do that. I'm going to probably make this in two parts, so this is just part one, the early to mid period of the band. So um, my history with the band started out around 1999 hearing about them um, through like a couple email lists, Epigram, and then on some of the message boards around 99-2000s, Mike Portnoy's forum specifically. But I um, I heard they were really avant, quote unquote avant-garde for progressive metal, being a Dream Theater fan. And um, you know, I, I, I didn't really get the chance to check them out until I really heard about the fact they were playing at the inaugural Prague Power USA Festival in Lansing, Illinois, which years later, a couple of year, a year, less than a year later, moved to Atlanta. But the first one was in Lansing, Illinois. It was at a J.J. Kelly's, I remember. It was like $20 to go to this thing. There were like 11 or 12 bands, 13 bands, something like that, over two days. And it wasn't that expensive. I remember I was hanging out in the Mike Portnoy's dot com's chat room and one of my friends paul cashman who i know on there uh just talking to him on there pelaz as he was known was recommending i go you know i'd i'd never spent time i just had heard about them and plus uh, another band i hadn't heard about and not checked out but meant to around that same time symphony x was also going to be at that festival and um it was just very inexpensive i'd gone to near fest northeast at rock festival earlier in the year so uh, and I and that was not cheap, but um, I was trying to weigh the, the the finances and decided this was in February 2001 when this, this this festival happened. But it was I was just talking to them. I think it was December of 2000, and um, I think their new album had come out around the time. And I again I hadn't checked it out, but I'd meant to because I know also the Dream Theater fanzine, fan club fanzine, did reviews and they reviewed both the new Symphony X and Pain of Salvation albums. They were kind of buzz bands around that time especially so but anyway so that's my introduction around 99 late 99 well I guess it would technically would be 2000 I heard about them in 99 but late in 2000 so um, I guess the other thing I can do and before I start to go back to their original history is I got this I found this this is see a, a, a magazine called see a tranquility which now the people that run this have a website called see a tranquility org uh, and Pete Pardo I know has a, a YouTube channel which he does what's hot and everything good channel check it out um, but yeah they did a whole guide this is before the perfect element the third album even had come out um, but a, a, a kind of a guide or just a and they have an article uh, uh, written by Daniel Gilmore of Pain of Salvation so but anyway so let's just backtrack here that's sort of the intro my intro but um, I got the guys to sign this when I saw them that, that, so I did go to that concert in 2001, and it turned out to be the, I consider it the greatest concert of my life, partly because they were on three or four hours sleep, and it went, they played for uh, almost two hours. It was just, it was amazing, so. But, okay, so their history, they started out, they're from Sweden, Pain of Salvation, and um, formed by Daniel Gildenlow. They originally were known as Reality in the 80s, late 80s, and he was really young. He was like 11, 12 years old when he formed the band Reality. Um, just reading on Wikipedia, just reminding myself of that. But they put out a demo or two, I guess. I just found it reminded of that. Uh, two different tracks. Uh, one's called Unknowing, and the other one's called Repent, uh, which had a, an '80s tinge to it, but also were very epic. It was almost like slight hints of power metal in it. But um, I remember after getting into the band, I enjoyed those demos more and more. Um, but that was in like the early to mid, early 90s, like 91, 92, something like that, 93. Um, I think it says in 1993 on, on the YouTube videos, because they're on YouTube. But um, but then uh, they put out an, a de an actual official demo after they changed their name, or I don't know if it had, after or before they changed their name, called Hereafter, which uh, it was a cassette tape, and it has a lot of the early, the first album's demos and stuff, and um, I never actually found a hard copy. I always wanted that. I could still check eBay for that. Um, even though I don't have a, I actually don't have, uh, I technically do have a cassette player, but I would have to really go to great lengths to try to use it at this point. Um, anyway, so that demo had a lot of, a lot of stuff, and that was in the mid-90s. They were shopping around and got signed uh, to some label. I, I don't know if it was Inside Out Music that time, but 
1997, they finally put out their debut album called Entropia, uh, which was very impressive. Uh, the band consisted of the quote unquote classic lineup of the band, other than the second, one of the main leaders of the band was this guy named Daniel Magic. M A Mag, D D M A G D I C. Uh, he was with the band in the early years with Daniel Gildlow. Uh, eventually, you know, and along all the drummer and um, Frederick Hermanson joined, and Christopher Gildlow joined. Although I want to backtrack the the bass player, Christopher Gildlow, Daniel's younger brother, the bass player. Their one of their drummer, one of their bass players rather, was this guy named Gustav Helm who was with them in the early to mid 90s, but then he left before the recording of this record, Entropia. But he later went on to Meshuggah, um, was another Swedish metal band, of course. Uh, but he's not with Meshuggah anymore. But that's just a note, kind of one of the members used to be with Band Salvation was with Meshuggah. So, but Entropia is a great record, a great debut album especially. Um, my favorite track on this album, it's a concept album too, but my favorite track is the bass, funky bass led, it's actually not bass led, but I always thought it was, uh, People Passing By. It's just, it's, the groove on that song is just addictive and uh, infectious, and um, my favorite part of that whole song probably is the, um, besides the dynamics and everything, the, the, the quiet to loud kind of stuff back and forth, is the kind of unison section with the keyboards and the guitars, I think it is, it might be a bass line. It's all an offbeat, but if you listen, you listen to that song about ten times. And you listen for like with headphones on, you can notice the um, sort of the, <laughs> the part the it, basically in the bridge I'm talking about, or like yeah, the bridge. So, but this record is really without a bad song. It's an interesting concept about like a sort of a fantasy world, entropia. It's sort of going to sleep at <laughs> the beginning of going to sleep, going waking up in a new world. Um, forward explanation point is one of the most popular tracks their first song they ever were released as a band uh the whole we're not afraid of you we're not afraid winning a war um uh, stress is very odd very uh, it's almost like frank zappa revival is a song that will grow on you more and more planes of dawn is one of the one of my favorites uh night mist uh the little tapping i always think of van halen <laughs> finish what you started when i hear that tapping but um the segue in that song is is just awesome, um, and yeah, like I said "Planes of Dawn" the, the second to last, not the, the last closing acoustic epilogue piece, but um, "Planes of Dawn" has this great kind of crescendo, and it, I'd put this as a top, that is a top three track on this album. So, "Tropia" nineteen ninety seven. So the next year they released another concept album, "One Hour by the Concrete Lake." Um, and among the early Pan Salvation albums, most fans consider this to be the worst, but most fans also that love the early Pan Salvation love this album still or enjoy it more than more recent stuff, I guess, which I'll get into in the next video. But um, it's a concept album, another concept album about uh, a couple things, one being this water war <laughs> in some part of uh, Russia, I think, in one of the Baltic states. But also talking about the Native Americans, I don't know, I was reading about it. There's a whole thing on, on Daniel's essay in here about it. I remember reading this when I got this issue. But um, anyway, I mean, there's a song called Water, of course, which <laughs> has the lyrics, and we flush, and we flush. It's like a waste of water. I know there was something about the lakes in some part of, some parts of at least... What I'm referring to, whether it was the, the Baltic states or, or um, you know, Ke uh, not Kiev, I'm thinking of um, parts of Russia or an Eastern Bloc nation where there was uh, the lakes where, where the water became um, unusable, undrinkable, basically, and it, it like killed off a lot of the sea life. I think that was part of it. Um, anyway, but from a musical standpoint, songs like Inside, um, was a song they played live a lot when I saw them live they played it a, a number of times um, uh, and Inside Out actually that that to me almost sounds like power metal but in a good way it's like them doing power metal um, and this is the first album with uh, Johan Hallgren as the second guitar Daniel Magica obviously had left and that, that was the lineup for a number of years with Johan Longall as the drummer Frederick Hermanson as the keyboard player uh, of course Daniel Gilmore uh, as the lead you know, singer and, and uh, songwriter. 
and his brother Christopher Gildenlow. Um, but yeah, went over by the Concrete Lake. Um, what more to say about it? I mean, New Year's Eve is another great song. Handful of Nothing is very powerful, very lyrical, very dark. Home, Home is one of my favorites on this. It's got a, a bridge that's very good. The, the harmonies on that song are really nice. Um, yeah, I mean, Black Hills. I think this album actually, in some ways, is one of those cases where it's better than some of its parts, too, in some ways. But sonically, it, it does resemble uh, Entropia naturally. It was the second album. I don't know the budget was that much different. So, so moving on, then this is around the time I, I came on board. They put out in 2000 The Perfect Element. And this copy, I've got a couple different copies of. This is one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, my favorite song by the band is the title track, actually. The way it, uh, you know, never seems to end in a good way. <laughs> With, um, it's such an epic closing piece. Uh, such a, like a revelation, almost. -da 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 -da. You know, it just... Um, dun, 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 dun. The keyboard work, and especially just... The title, uh, it's, it's just, this, this album, I've got it on vinyl, of course, which I, I guess I can go in, I can show a little bit about, which I can't remember how much I've, sh if I've seen, I've shown the two Pain of Salvation vinyls that I purchased, um, but, uh, my, s another favorite track on, among many favorites on this album, look at the stain on this sucker, is, um, In the Flesh, the piano work and the kind of, um, the segues and the harmony, the vocal, the vocal use. When I first heard that, this is the first album I ever heard from the Pain of Salvation, of course. It sounded like Mike Patton. I was like, this, obviously he's a fan of, like, Faith No More and Mr. Bungle, and, you know, I came to learn that. The, probably Pain, Pain of Salvation's two biggest influences, per se, I've always found, were to be Mike Patton slash Faith No More and then Queensryche. And uh, in, in Gildenloaf specifically, I guess you could say that they have a lot of other elements. They're the ba the jazzy and bass led stuff, the funk. Um, of course, they're um, oh, and of course I get the uh, the problem of trying to put this back in, but I don't know. Just to continue to go over why that, this is one of my top ten records of all time. Songs like Reconciliation is really catchy. Um, King of Loss. Uh, I wrote a whole thing in the blog a couple of years ago on analyzing a lot of this and talking about. King of Lost, the lyrical part of it, it's very bluesy, but the dynamics and the ending is just loud, as, but at the same time, the string section just absolutely uh, floors me every time I hear it. Actually, that was like the first favorite song on this album, that and then her voices, which has um, that, uh, that, that uh, almost sounds like learning to live from Dream Theater in a way, but dun, 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 it's very um, danceable almost. You know, that part, the the second half of her voices. I actually remember when I was at that concert in, in Lansing, hoping they would play for her voices, and they didn't. So even though it was the greatest show of my life, they didn't actually play one thing I was hoping for. But I don't know if this sucker is going to want to go back in at the moment. I'm not going to bother with it. The but, yeah, so, you know, this is weird. It's weird how the back of this writes it as the different chapters, which I've never fully thought of the album in that way, but, you know, Used is a great opener, Ashes is a song that sounds very industrial, it reminds me of, of I always thought of it sort of influenced by Nine Inch Nails in a way, very intense, very dark, um, you know, this record is just so good, and in this particular, it has epilogue, this, this particular version has a couple extra parts to it. Um, including this, this compact disc has a couple extra bonus tracks, Beyond the Mirror, um, which I used to listen to frequently, Never Learned to Fly, and Time Weaver's Tale, and then the video for Ashes, so. So yeah, they were the sort of, the best things since Slice of Bread when this came out, and I just really, like, revelation that how good they were, and a lot of the other people that loved Dream Theater and Progressive Rock were just floored by them. And then the next year... They um, put out an album which they recorded in like, I don't know, a couple weeks called Remedy Lane, which they just did an anniversary um, anniversary release, remix, and live version at, at Prague Party USA in Atlanta. I want to say it was 2015, though. It wasn't 20. Yeah, it wasn't this past year. It was a year ago, like a year ago, September. And um, this is the first new album that I heard from the band after becoming a fan because I obviously, when The Perfect Element Part 1 came out, I... Um, I hadn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that I didn't buy it, I hadn't heard it, so it's a cool stain on this, this orange. 
But Remedy Lane, whereas I didn't even mention the perfect elements, this concept all about two kids and childhood and, you know, it has a lot of dark themes. Just look at it. Just the titles. <clears throat> it deals with, it, like, incest and um, parts of the lyrics of saying they want to run. It reminds me of, of Marillion at points sometimes. But um, getting back to Remedy Lane, um, Remedy Lane's about Daniel Gilmore's relationships. Um, so I've already shown that one. Um, my favorite parts of Remedy Lane, um, and Remedy Lane I would just put as just slightly b behind Perfect Element. It's, the production is better than the Perfect Element Part 1, but um, but uh, I, it didn't have the emotional, quite the emotional impact that the Perfect Element Part 1 had, but um, oh, the song, uh, the closing track, Beyond the Pale, is just immense. It's, it's right up there. It's like maybe my second favorite song just to the title track, The Perfect Element. Um, that in um, trace a trace of blood, which um, let's see if I is this the this is the second one. So would be on the other one. I was trying to read through the lyrics earlier. Um, a trace of blood is is progressive rock. You know, it's it the dynamics in that song, the, the middle section, um, but the lyrics. I never knew your name, but I will miss you just the same. I was I was uh, to live for you. Uh, I lost the the will to live. And all the day, and all the day, and all the day you came. I'll never be the same, but I will love you just the same. You were, you were to be the first. How wonderful! Now I will always fear to hope again. What the lyrics I was thinking of? Oh, that's the first phrase. I'll I'll never be the same, but I will love you just the same. I was prepared to be a, your father, and how can I ever prepare for that again? It's about his his wife, I think, miscarrying. Um, and, um, you can see, like, the emotional impact, but it, this, it's more than one relationship, because it, it, it's dated, I know there's dates on these, at one point, I remember looking through the, the concept, and there's, there were dates of, you know, different years, and different cities, and stuff like that, um, stuff like, um, ah, man, oh, I didn't realize the vinyl version has Thorn Clown at the end of Side B, maybe the original track listing, but the song I'm thinking of, Assuming it's on here, because I haven't looked through this vinyl thoroughly. Um, Undertow. Undertow, great epic ballad. Uh, it, it soars. Um, dry Out of the Woods. And Chainsling Dry Out of the Woods, those two work really well. There's kind of an ethnic element to that. Very The build up, the crescendo is just terrific. And then they release a live album, which I'll talk about in the next video, with a great version of that as well. Um, of, be of, two, of two beginnings and ending theme, great opening part, although the, cr chronologically in the concept of this album it doesn't, uh, again, they're not like the start of the story, that's why they, the title <laughs> ending theme. Fandango, um, which sort of sounds like the name of it, it's sort of danceable in a way, um, but in an offbeat. This Heart of Mine, I Pledge, is a, a great ballad and actually could have gotten the radio, I always thought. I played it on KFAI, but it's very accessible. Um, Sort of ballad, I don't know what you could pair it to exactly. Um, Rope Ends is another favorite. Any people that don't even like the band have, have enjoyed that song. So, so yeah, that Remedy Lane. <clears throat> a lot of people just just adore this album in um, in Pennsylvania's history. Um, you know, it's it's a favorite of theirs, including that drummer guy who's a friend of mine. Um, but I, I guess to me, am I putting these in the wrong order? I might be. To me, it's 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 like close second to Perfect Element, but I mean the first four albums are all all just great records, and they basically supplanted Pain and Salvation. And this is in 2002 as a favorite band of mine, of mine, of mine and many others. And they were kind of uh, you know all the rage, all the shit basically at that point. They Daniel Gilmore no toured with Transatlantic, and he was going to be potentially with OSI, and he was just kind of the thing. He played Hammer of the Gods, Led Zeppelin thing. Uh, with Mike Portnoy, he did the vocals, even though he wasn't much of a Zeppelin fan. Um, but yeah, so this was kind of their peak period, and um, I will uh, discuss uh, the rest of their history since 2002, 2003, leading up to the the new album in the passing light of day in the next video. But thanks for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.